Good morning, and welcome to the Child and Family Treatment and Support Services Principles and Documentation Overview of State Guidance Webinar. Uh, my name is Yvette Kelly. I'm with the Community Technical um, Assistance Center, and I'm going to be joined by my colleague Ann Cuppinger, as well as our state partners from the Division of Integrated Community Services for Children and Families, the New York, New York State Office of Mental Health. And so before we get started, I just want to go over a few housekeeping things relative to today's webinar. Um, the slides and recording will be posted to our CTAC website within the next few days. So um, if you have someone who wasn't able to join us, uh, please feel free to refer them there. Or if you need to refer back uh, to this webinar, you'll be able to find it there in the next couple of days. Um, there will be a brief question and answer period following today's presentation. Um, we're asking that participants submit their questions at any point during the webinar. We are expecting a large number of attendees. So again, if you have questions for the presenters, if you could just please submit those questions via the chat box feature so we can uh, do our best to arrange them so that uh, if we have time to address them at the end, we will. Um, if you don't see the chat box available, if you just click on the bottom uh, dialog button, uh, bubble, it should, you should be able to see it on the right hand side. All right, so um, again, just want to remind you that uh, while the information uh, today is going to be talking about some of the best practices that support quality documentation, providers will need to refer to the state guidance document for official guidance. So the presentation um, is not the official guidance for. Uh, the policies and procedures, and again, if you, you would just need to refer um, to those manuals, as well as your own internal agency policy and procedures, um, which are in alignment with the state-issued guidance. Um, as always, due, the, due to the dynamic nature of our work, information is current as of the date of today's presentation. And so briefly, just want to share with you how we're going to spend our hour uh, on the webinar. So we'll just kind of review some background as it relates to the CFTSS services. We'll talk about some of the importance around docu um, documenting, uh, talk and touch upon the golden thread, treatment planning, uh, progress notes. Then we'll uh, talk a little bit about the supervisor review uh, that's required. And uh, my colleague Ann will review some of the resources with you. And so with that being said, I'm going to pass it over to our presenter today, Shannon Portran, and uh, she'll get us started. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining. Thank you, Yvette, for that lead-in. Uh, my name is Shannon Fortran. I'm the Statewide Coordinator for Children, Family, Treatment, and Support Services with the Office of Mental Health. I'm actually joined today by my colleague and co-author, Diana Manganelli, also with the Office of Mental Health. Thank you for being here, Diana. Um, we both would like to give a sincere thank you and appreciation to our state partners in the development of this documentation guidance uh, for their feedback and support, so uh, the Department of Health, the Office of Alcoholism and Substance Abuse Services and the Office of Children and Family Services. We do appreciate their um, support and feedback, as I said. So just to reiterate before we jump into the content, um, what Yvette said. So um, you'll hear us talk a lot about uh, the documentation guidance, not just as it relates to state required um, minimum requirements as it relates to documentation, but also the underlying best practices and principles that really guide uh, the process, uh, most specifically related to treatment planning and its associated documentation. Um, so you'll hear that throughout. So really this uh, next hour is intended to be an overview, kind of a level setting to ensure that we're all on the same page, we all have context to what is the purpose and the content of the documentation guidance. So with that said, um, I think we're all quite familiar with the timeline as it relates to the implementation of CFTSS. But I think it's important to note that as of right now, documentation related to crisis intervention and youth peer support and training has not yet rolled in to CFTSS. So that will occur on January 2020. So when we're talking about these um, documentation requirements and the content and you know, the documentation guidance in general, um, as it relates to CFTSS, these two services, um, from a lack of a better term, are carved out until January. And those um, services, as you may know, are um, available to the home community-based services um, children enrolled in that program. 
So we just wanted to point that out. And that's not to say that as of January 2020, once these services roll in, they will also um, have to adhere to uh, the documentation manual and the requirements herein. Bear with us for a second. All righty. So the documentation guidance, our intention behind it was not just to create a list of requirements, the hard and fast requirements, the elements that must be captured within a treatment plan. Um, we wanted it to be more than that. We wanted it to be rich as a resource and support to the field, as I said before, to really review the best practices and the principles and how that all interconnects with the standards of care specific to CFTSS. Uh, so that's what we're going to be looking at today. Yes, we will be reviewing the requirements, but we're also going to be weaving in some of those underlying best practices and principles. So when looking at the documentation guidance, the way to use it is you're going to see language like must and should. So must uh, definitely relates to a requirement. So if you hear um, this element must be in a treatment plan, that's a requirement, as opposed to should, which kind of ties back to the best practices and principles and is more so a recommendation. Uh, we also included tip boxes, and that's to be a further resource to provide context and expand upon a point, whether it relates to a requirement or a best practice. And then lastly, we also have an appendix section. For right now, there's one, uh, and it's in regards to writing goals and objectives, and that's not to say that there won't be more in the future. We see those as a more of technical assistance uh, documents and uh, just further a resource and support um, to you all. By no means is it a requirement. Um, Okay, so importance of documentation. So we hear that quite a bit, whether it's in training or other platforms, we constantly hear about how critical documentation is as it relates to service provision. But we constantly hear, I don't know if it's just me, but you, you hear if it's not written down, it didn't happen, or if it's not written down, you can't bill for it. And yes, those, those elements are certainly true, and yes, it is critical for billing practices and record keeping as it relates to service provision, but we see it as so much more than that. You know, we see it as a true process, and I, I don't think it's a surprise as to why it's an actual service component under other licensed practitioner, OLP, and community psychiatric support and treatment, or CPST, because it truly is a service that you're delivering to the children and family. It, it, it's an intervention, an activity that you're doing in partnership with that child and family. Um, and you'll hear us say that. So if there's one takeaway, I might be a little biased, but if there's one takeaway from today's presentation, we hope that that resonates with you all, that this is truly a process and we see this as an integral aspect of service delivery, regardless of what service you're providing to the children and family. And that's not to minimize the other significant aspects that it is needed for reimbursement purposes, and it is a record, certainly, but that it is a part of service provision. And um, one of the things that we we um, tend to say is that a provider, as a provider, you may own the treatment plan, so to speak, but the child and family owns the content. So how do you achieve that without doing it in true partnership and collaboration? Um, and it truly is a frame of mind as a service provider, how you approach documentation, how you approach treatment planning really guides that relationship and that engagement um, right from admission. Okay, other things that we hear quite often, and these certainly aren't unique uh, to CFTSS specifically, and likely most, if not all of you, are already incorporating some of these core principles into your service delivery. But we want to take it a step further. How are you incorporating these core principles into documentation? Because if we're saying that treatment planning is a part of service delivery, then it stands to reason that these core principles would be indicated and represented quite clearly in your documentation and treatment plan. And a lot of these overlap. So if we, if we look at these in just the strict context of documentation, if we look at, say, least restrictive, community-based, we're talking about setting. We're talking about truly meeting the family where they are. Um, you know, it, it could be, you know, that a need manifests, for instance, in the child's home, right? But yet, the documentation illustrates that the service is being rendered in the school. There could be many, many reasons why that's occurring. It could be that it's very early 
in the engagement process and the service provider is working to engage that family and really educate them on the benefit of working with that child where their needs are manifesting, that's quite possible. But we would want to see that in the documentation. Um, we would want to see that clear linkage um, from the assessment of determining where the needs are manifesting to where the setting, the service is being provided. And certainly the setting we would hope to see is commensurate with the actual service being provided and the intervention as well. And then there's some other things that overlap. So for in the documentation guidance, you'll see that child-centered, family-focused, individualized, strength-based, we kind of bring those together because we see that those as all interconnected. So identifying what the child's and family's priorities are, what their needs are, what their preferences are, and doing that in a truly collaborative process so that it's individualized to the child and family. And then certainly strength-based, I mean, we say that quite often, uh, but what is strength-based? And by concentrating on the inherent strengths of the child and family and their supports, you know, we're aiding towards recovery and empowerment. I mean, how often have you worked with a family and you ask them, what are the needs? What are the issues you're seeing? And they, <laughs> very quickly, they might be able to articulate what those needs and what those issues are, but then maybe when you ask them, okay, well, what's going right? What are the strengths that you're seeing in your child? What are the strengths that you see as a parent, caregiver, as a support to that child in yourself? And maybe that's where the work starts, right? But that's, that's the place, that's the foundational work is identifying those inherent skills, those inherent strengths within the child and family. And it's a place, it's a launching pad in which to promote change, right, and service delivery. Multi-system, uh, I, I think we all know that, the, that um, you know, many of the children that are served in the mental health system um, are interacting with multi-child serving systems, whether it be education, whether it be juvenile justice, whether it be foster care. And this pretty much ties back to how are you in your documentation demonstrating your coordination, your collaboration, and your involvement with the, these other child serving systems so that we're not delivering services in a fragmented way. Uh, um, so culturally competent, uh, how we frame it, actually the documentation guidance is being culturally and linguistically responsive as opposed to competent, and that really ties into the understanding and awareness of um, a family's experiences as it relates to the cultural group that they identify with. And I think it's important to note, and bear with me while I read this, but I think it's important to note that, it, and we did this quite intentionally, in our documentation guidance we gave a list, and it's not a comprehensive list by any means, but a list of what we're referring to when we mean culture. So oppression and expression, disability, religion, immigration status, ethnicity, sex, sexual orientation, gender identity, social diversity with respect to race. I mean, these are all key elements to incorporate, not just into your treatment planning, but into the assessment process and all throughout service delivery. And this definitely ties into and backs against um, trauma-informed. So trauma-informed is not just the interconnection between cultural factors and the experience of trauma, but it's also promoting resilience and those protective factors, and that ties in again to strength. So all of these, uh, as I, I think you're starting to see, are interconnected. And then lastly, developmentally appropriate. So this is more than just um, recognizing the child's chronological age, but also being cognizant of their developmental stage and tying that into the appropriate services, certainly, and appropriate interventions as it relates to their developmental stage. Okay, golden thread, another term we hear quite often. So golden thread, essentially what it boils down to is that connection from beginning to end, from the moment you meet with that family, whether it be the assessment all the way down to discharge summary, there's a clear connection from everything that you did with that family. It, there's, there's a clear thread, so to speak. A few weeks ago, I was asked by a provider to give an example of golden thread outside of the mental health field, something they felt could be more universally applied. So say, for instance, that an individual falls and they get extreme pain in their leg. They self-refer to their doctor. Doctor asks, what are your symptoms? Well, I fell, and now I have excruciating pain in my leg. All right, the doctor orders some tests. They assess the patient, maybe some x-rays, and they determine, they diagnose 
the client with a broken leg. Treatment is resetting the leg, putting it in a cast, followed by a few sessions of physical therapy. So when the patient heals and they're referred to the physical therapist, that physical therapist gets the doctor's notes, and they're able to, do, they're able to clearly see the linkage from the moment that that patient self-refers to the moment that they received that referral for physical therapy, why that patient is in their office, why they were given the treatment they were given, why the assessments ordered were, uh, were ordered, and you know, say for instance the PTCs that blood work was ordered, but there's no indication of why that happened. That's outside of the golden thread, right? We're looking for that clear connection, and I don't mean to be overly simplistic, but from the beginning to the end, from the moment that that family either self-refers or you get a recommendation or referral from an outside referral source, to the moment that you're completing that discharge summary and also referring to an external provider, if that be the case, that there's a clear indication from beginning to end why the activities that occurred, occurred. So with that, we have a few considerations, a few questions um, as a resource to you uh, to ask yourself when you're going through the documentation process with the family, when you're going through the treatment planning process, uh, what are some of the things that you might be looking for to indicate that you are aligning with the golden thread principle? So for instance, I'm not going to read through all of them, but like I said, is the assessment or reassessment, because right, assessments are ongoing, it's not just the initial assessment. Um, is, is it reflected in the treatment plan? And I think what this all ties back to, and you'll, you'll hear us say this again and again, but essentially what we want to see happen is when writing a progress note, you want to know that the activities captured within that progress note tie back to a goal or objective agreed upon with the child and family and that service provider, which then ties back to maybe medical necessity or an assessment conducted by that provider, and there's a clear link from beginning to end. Okay, so treatment planning process. Okay, so this is kind of a reiteration of what we've been saying and, and certainly backs into some of the principles. So certainly it's individualized, right? We're not rubber stamping these treatment plans. They're unique to every child and family that you serve. They're up to date and evolving and I, I, and I think that is also reinforcing the thought that this is a process. It's not a moment in time activity, and that it is a service that you're constantly engaging in with that family, right? Grounded in medical necessity. So we, we don't go into detail on this in this presentation, but it is mentioned in the documentation guidance that as a provider, as a CFTS service provider, uh, you, you'll get your initial recommendation, certainly, uh, that that child meets medical necessity for a given service. But then the responsibility for meeting continued stay criteria for medical necessity uh, is grounded in the documentation that, you're, that you have. So that, that's what that's referring to. Certainly built on strengths developed in partnership. Uh, as I said before, it's written to reflect the vision and priorities of the youth and family. Uh, I think it's important to note that uh, in, in our documentation guidance, we do very clearly indicate that goals are broad, where objectives are more specific and measurable. Uh, they describe the service and interventions. And then lastly, there is clear uh, scope, duration, and frequency. Okay. So we're going to be a broken record by the end of this, I'm telling you. So it's not just a piece of paper. It's a process, and we really can't emphasize that enough. And, you know, it's an agreement between that provider, the service provider, and that child and family. It keeps you both accountable, right? You sat down, you conducted an assessment, you created um, a treatment plan, and that's exactly what it is, right? It's a plan that you both mutually agreed upon, and it keeps you both accountable. We'll talk a little bit about if there's, not, if there's, um, if you're reassessing and you're not seeing progress, uh, how you would engage the family to talk about uh, revisiting the goals or objectives as they were previously agreed upon. I mean, this is a fluid conversation that you're continually revisiting with the family, um, and it keeps you on track, right? It keeps you where you need to be, it keeps you aligned with the golden thread. And ultimately, it helps to, to give a picture, a roadmap, so to speak, to that child and family and to you as a service provider of where you are and where you need to go in order to discharge from that service, ultimately. Okay, now for those requirements. Uh, the treatment plan components. So for some services, some CFTSS, um, 
a diagnosis is not required. So for other licensed practitioner, for community psychiatric support and treatment, uh, this is where you would indicate if the child does not have a behavioral health diagnosis, you would indicate uh, the symptoms or challenges. For the other services, however, for PSR or the two peer services, family peer, youth peer, you would indicate the child's behavioral health diagnosis. If you're not including it in the treatment plan, you would just have to indicate where in the child's health record or case file uh, we, we could find that diagnosis or where you could or other, um, other practitioners that are consented to view the case file. Uh, certainly, the child's needs and strengths, if you're a family peer, you would be identifying the families, the parents, caregivers' needs and strengths, uh, child's treatment goals and objectives. Again, for family peer, you would be, you're working specifically with the parent or caregiver, so that would tie back to goals and objectives related to that activity. Services, service components, um, you all know that CFTSS has multiple service components for each service, so you'd have to identify which of those service components um, you'll be working on with the family, and then certainly the interventions or activities that tie in to those specific service components. Frequency and duration, how often and how long are you going to be delivering these services? Service location, so this backs into what we were just discuss uh, discussing in the core principles regarding setting and how that all interfaces with the goals and objectives and the service that's going to be rendered. A uh, list of other service providers and individuals involved in the child's care. And um, it's quite possible, as we said before, that these children are receiving services or involved in many different child serving systems. Um, so it could be natural supports, it could be, could be collaterals, uh, whatever the case may be. Safety plan, you'll note that there's an asterisk here. A safety plan is not required unilaterally for every child enrolled in CFTSS, and we'll speak about that a little bit more. Discharge criteria, you want to know from the moment of admission, what do we have to do to ensure that we're ready for discharge? What does discharge look like? The name, title, and signature of the staff providing the service, the signature of the child and caregiver, you'll note that there's another asterisk. Um, it's quite possible, like we said, that um, these children that you're working with could be in foster care, for instance, and it would not be appropriate to secure the signature from a parent. So it might be the medical consent in that case. But the um, asterisk would direct you to further guidance in our documentation manual and to the lead designated agency, likely OCFS in that case. And then the signature of the licensed supervisor uh, for the two peer services for family peer and youth peer, it could either be a licensed practitioner or it could be a peer supervisor. Okay, treatment plan timeframes. So, <clears throat> so the treatment plan, the first treatment plan would need to be completed by the fourth session or no later than 30 days after admission, which is the first face-to-face. -face. So we recognize and appreciate that because this is a process, you might not have all the information to do a comprehensive treatment plan. And that's completely appreciated and understood by that 30th day. So our ask is that you identify the most prioritized goals and objectives and interventions to meet the most immediate needs identified for that child and family with the expectation that you're going to be evolving, gathering further information as you progress through the treatment planning process with that family. A formal review must take place at a minimum of every six months or 180 days. We'll talk about what a formal review is versus an update. So a plan is revised, an update is, occurs when services are added or discontinued or when circumstances warrant a change in the goal, objective, or intervention. Um, it could be the emergence of new clinical issues or symptoms that need to be addressed, a crisis or other um, significant life event. So that would fall under the category of an update. It's a targeted revision to the treatment plan versus a formal review, which is more comprehensive, and we'll talk about that in a little bit more detail. Okay, so just to reiterate, treatment plan reviews are due every six months at a minimum. They can occur more frequently. Uh, if in the event, say that you um, admit a child into a service on October 1st, and for whatever reason, there is a formal review that takes place on, say, December 1st. It's before the six month is due. That would reset the clock. So that six months would now take place 
six months from December 1st as opposed to October 1st. So that's important to note. It's not based solely on that admission date. Okay, so I think what's key here for a formal review versus a revision is that it is an assessment of the progress for each goal and objective. So it's a comprehensive review of the entire treatment plan. Um, certainly there's input from the child's family and other service providers. Um, there is, and I, you know, it's not noted here, but there would be the requirement of signatures from certainly the service provider that owns that uh, service, uh, that treatment plan, uh, supervisors, and the child and family were appropriate. And then up, uh, adjusting and updating goals and, uh, and objectives, uh, you could be canceling a goal or objective that maybe has been met or um, for whatever other reason, you found one that, need, that is more prioritizing for the family and um, you've deferred a goal or objective for the time being. Integrated treatment planning. So this is not a requirement, but we strongly encourage that when there are multiple child family treatment and support services being delivered, with, by the same agency that to reduce burden on the children and families, to reduce burden on staff certainly, that um, there be an integrated treatment plan. Um, we, we would expect that it would streamline communication and coordination among those providers, um, and as I said, certainly reduce the burden of having discrete treatment plans for each service all delivered by the same agency. So we do appreciate and understand that everyone's EHR systems are varied, and your capacity to do that to whatever degree may vary, and that's completely appreciated, but we just want to clarify that it is strongly encouraged, although not a requirement, it is strongly encouraged for the benefit of the child and family. All right, as promised, so we're going to talk a little bit about safety plan. So when we're referring to safety plan uh, as it relates to CFTSS, what we're referring to is a clinical safety plan. It is a tool to assist the child and family to recognize and respond to an elevation of symptoms or indication of risk in a safe and effective way. So we commonly receive the question about whether or not a safety plan is part of the treatment plan. It certainly can be. It certainly can be that um, you as a service provider may be coordinating with an out outside external service provider. Maybe. Um, you're a PSR worker and the child is engaged with an external clinic and there's already an established safety plan, clinical safety plan. There's nothing prohibiting you from coordinating, collaborating with that clinician to obtain a copy of that, uh, of that safety plan and reinforcing the skills with that child and family to re further reinforce that plan. And maybe even adding yourself as a support uh, onto that plan. That's certainly um, allowed and encouraged. So one thing that we do want to say, so I did say back in um, a, a little bit earlier in the presentation that it is not inherently required for all children just because they've been enrolled into a, a child and family treatment and support service. However, if a child is receiving a crisis-related service, um, whether it be under OLP, whether it be under CPST, they would need a safety plan. That is when it is a requirement. And then certainly, you know, we do want to highlight that regardless of what service you are rendering, it is good practice to pr provide the family with a resource, whether it be a quote unquote clinical treatment plan or a resource for them so they know who to contact, they know what their resources are in the event of an emergency. We think that's just good practice. Um, so certainly a safety plan would need to be updated uh, if there's a change in mental status. Uh, one thing that we do want to highlight, so I gave the example of a PSR worker working with an external treatment provider, but what happens if that family is not connected with a clinical provider? Um, and as a provider, you recognize that there's a need for an assessment of risk or perhaps a mental status uh, because you're noticing a marked change in their mood, affect, or behavior, and it's concerning to you. So certainly, loop back in with your supervisor, right? Uh, but then also, if it's outside of your scope of practice to deliver such an assessment to determine mental status or assessment of risk, uh, we would want to see that you're linking, you're referring that family to the needed services and supports to get 
uh, the support they need um, through that. And then certainly indicating the outcome and plan as a result of your linkage and referral. Okay, discharge plan and summary. They are two separate things. So discharge plan, as we said before, is a required component in treatment planning. So this is what's occurring at the very beginning from the moment of admission. This is, these are the elements that you're identifying in partnership with the child and family. What are the activities? What are the changes that we would need to see to know that we're ready for discharge? So that's the discharge plan. The discharge summary, on the other hand, is, um, and this is quite common, certainly, uh, that it's, it's a summary of the reason for discharge. Um, if the discharge was not planned, the efforts that the provider has made to engage the family, uh, the services needed at discharge, services that have been provided by the CFTS agency, a summary of progress, um, a list of referrals for ongoing treatment um, and or rehabilitative services, and then the primary agency or provider at the time of discharge. So what this is, is it's a snapshot. It's a snapshot summarizing all that you've done with that family during the course of treatment and service provision, and then it provides that snapshot and summary to the um, referral source that you're linking the family to upon discharge. Progress notes, so more requirements. Okay, so progress notes are both for billable and non-billable activities. Certainly a progress note would need to be written if there's a direct service provided to the child or family, uh, but also there are instances where a progress note would be needed even if a non-billable activity occurred, such as coordination or collaboration with a contact on behalf of the child and family, and then certainly if there's a significant or unexpected event. So Medicaid does require that progress notes be written contemporaneously to the service, and that's pretty standard across um, various programs and service types. Okay, so the hard and fast components of a progress note. So some of these may be pre-filled, depending on your EHR system, certainly some of the demographic information, like your agency name, the child's name, but just to outline everything, so it would be standard demographic information, the child's name, or if you're working with a parent or um, caregiver or collateral, it'd be their name, date of birth, the SIN number, the Medicaid number, the Medicaid ID number, the type of contact, so the modality, likely face-to-face, -face, um, and the modality, certainly uh, individual family or group session, which services provided, the duration of service, so we'd want to see start and end time, and then likely your EHR will pre-fill what that total time was, and then the name of the person and agency providing the service. It keeps going. Date of service, the location in which the service was provided. So this is that setting, right, as it ties back, and this is where, you know, you would want to see the golden thread, how that setting that you rendered that service with ties back to the goals or objectives, or if it's not a service that was previously agreed upon via the treatment planning process with the child and family, there's indication why there's a different setting um, that's being utilized. The participants who was present during the session, the interventions provided or utilized, the child and youth or uh, family and caregiver's response to the intervention. How do you know that progress is being made, certainly? Goals and objectives that were addressed. Uh, and then the plan of action. So what's gonna happen next, right? So in addition to all that we just laid out over the past two slides, the components for a progress note, if it is a group session, all of the above would be included in addition to, even though we did mention that modality would have to be indicated, we, you really have to highlight that it's a group session. Um, the ratio, so it says number of participants, and then a little lower it says the service providers. That, that essentially represents the ratio, the provider to client ratio, and that includes both CFTSS and non-CFTSS children. One thing we do want to highlight, a progress note would have to be written for every child in the group. So say for instance that um, you're a family peer support worker and you're planning a five session group. So in that child's case record, we would expect to see five group progress notes aligning with the five sessions that were, that occurred with the service. So one per child. Okay, supervisory review. 
So I don't think, as much as we said that treatment planning is a process, it's a part of service delivery, it's an intervention in and of itself, we also cannot understate the significance of supervision um, during this process. So many agencies, maybe all agencies, do have certain policies and procedures as it relates to compliance. Um, and part of that might be from a fiscal component, there might be a compliance officer that will spot check case files and treatment planning for um, completeness and accuracy, but then also the supervisor should be doing that as well and supporting the, their um, staff person. Maybe it could be points of further support, further training, but I think that when we, when we talk about one of the service components being supervision signature, the supervisor must sign, sign the um, treatment plan, it's not just a sign off. Right? What that signature entails, what that means, what that represents is that there was routine supervision and consultation as it relates to that specific case and that specific service provider. So we see it as more meaningful than just a, a stamp on that treatment plan. Okay, so as I said before, it's, you know, spot checking, reviewing progress notes, reviewing the treatment plan to um, ensure that certainly things are in compliance, obviously, but then also that there's not a need for further support and further training for that staff person. And last but not least, we did have, we did end our documentation guidance with um, an additional documentation section. And this relates to, we recognize that there's some really critical information that um, we would recommend being captured in the case file or health record that um, might not be captured in the treatment plan. Um, some of that being the child's behavioral medical health history, uh, readily accessible uh, emergency medical information, you know, if a child has a rescue inhaler, if they have an EpiPen, if they have a med uh, medical health diagnosis, all relevant information. We know that uh, mental health and medical health are not operating in a vacuum, so it's critical to know these these pieces, and then certainly service orientation documentation in alignment with the standards of care. And what that speaks to is during the admission process, the documentation that you're sharing with family to orient them to um, the service and the agency. Okay, so we're gonna pause there, and we still have some time for questions and answers. Terrific, uh, thank you, Shannon. This is Ann Cuppinger from CTEC. Um, and Shannon, if you could um, give me back control of the slides while you look at the questions, I'll walk folks through some of these resource uh, documents. Thank you. Okay, so this is the DCFS mailbox. This mailbox is monitored by a number of staff in the Children's Division at OMH. So um, we, they really are encouraging you uh, to send them questions, small and large, and they will get to them as soon as they can. Um, so that if you have any questions about documentation requirements or practices, please uh, send those questions. Um, whoops, going the wrong way. Okay, um, this is uh, a list of some additional state mailboxes that pertain to, um, you know, various particular questions that you might have. Um, you know, if you're not sure, you can always email a couple of mailboxes um, and, uh, you know, see, uh, you know, where your question is most appropriate. So that's there for a resource. These are just links to two of the um, main state guidance documents that pertain to CFTSS services, not the only ones, but um, this is the um, provider manual and the um, documentation guidelines. Um, there's also, um, I put the link in here to um, the main page for all of the children's behavioral health transition. Um, and there's lots of billing information and rate information and all kinds of documents there. So it's a good place to bookmark and. Uh, check back. There are a number of listservs that we um, encourage folks to uh, sign up for so that you're getting updated information. Things change and there's new rules and regulations announced. Um, and, uh, you know, we, I don't see, we don't have your uh, CFTSS um, listserv on there. So when we send these slides, when we post these slides, we'll be sure to add that. Um, these are a couple tools on the CTAC website that you might find helpful. Um, in particular, I'd like to point out the managed care plan matrix so uh, you can get in contact with managed care plans about any uh, questions you have for them related to documentation. Um, and this uh, is, uh, provides um, our website link um, and invites you to also send any questions that you have to us as well. Um, and with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Shannon and colleagues 
to answer your questions. Thank you, Anne. So we are seeing a lot of questions um, as it relates to medical necessity and the nature and scope of um, CFTSS in general. So I will say, and I'm sorry that I didn't say this earlier because we are referencing <laughs> this information, but you can find this in the CFTSS provider manual, which can be found on the Department of Health website. Um, and we can certainly share that resource as well. So the standards of care that we reference, the medical necessity, the eligibility criteria, and that's broken out into three, three parts. So it's admission, continued stay, and discharge. Um, so that's a really great resource um, that I would certainly encourage you to avail yourself to. And then that's all part of the comprehensive provider manual. So just to clarify that, I apologize that we didn't um, indicate that. Um, so there's a question related to youth in foster care and parent signatures. So I will reinforce that um, there's an asterisk in the documentation guidance that refers you back to your lead designated agency. So in that case, it would be um, OCFS. So I strongly encourage you to reach out to them uh, to determine what is needed um, in the place of a family and parent, a family caregiver signature if that's not feasible. So um, another question, great question. Please clarify if an integrated treatment plan will have separate goals, objectives for each um, CFTS service. Uh, the answer to that is yes. Although I will say that, um, well, and I, uh, let me give a little rationale first, um, that I think that we all know, and this has said, have been said repeatedly, that these services can, can be provided distinctly and unique. You don't need one service contingent upon another um, to receive that service. And because of that, each of the services have to have the capacity to develop their own treatment plan. And I think that lent itself to folks thinking that they needed uh, distinct treatment plans, even if services are provided by the same agency. And what we're saying is that we're encouraging an integrated treatment plan. That said, it is a reality that sometimes there will be a shared goal. If the goal is broad and it's universal, um, it could be that um, there's a shared goal between maybe a CFTSS and CSR, but that, um, that has to distinctly tie back to the objectives and interventions specific to that service. Because if you remember, one of the service components, uh, one of the treatment plan um, components, excuse me, is service components as it relates to that specific service, and then certainly the interventions would have to tie into that as well. Uh, great question, what is an EHR? So that's your uh, electronic health record. So it's quite possible that you might not have one. Um, it is an infrastructure that you use to um, digitally record a treatment plan, progress notes, and all the associated documentation. And commonly that's, that's tied into your uh, billing software and generates a bill. It could be that you're still operating with paper, and that's true too. All of these principles will still apply. Um, that's, in, that's incredibly possible. But when we're referring to EHR, it's an electronic health record. Okay, bear with us. I'm just looking through. Uh, there's a question about whether a supervisor needs to sign a plan for that initial um, first treatment plan at the 30-day mark, the answer is yes. You would still need to meet um, all the components of the treatment plan for it to be complete. Um, there's a question regarding what um, are the licenses for a supervisor. I would refer you back to the CFTSS provider manual for that, and we can certainly give you that resource. I've put the, this, uh, the slide that everyone's looking at includes the link to these manuals, um, and these slides will be posted within a couple of days. Um, the links are also on CTAC's website. Um, if you look for the, there's like a scrolling page as you get onto our website, and there's a section on the children's transformation. All of these guidance documents are linked there as well. Thank you, Anne. Okay, so we have a question regarding um, looking for clarification regarding formal reviews not being based on the admission date. So uh, just to clarify, so um, a formal review, a formal treatment plan review is due at the latest every six months. However, a treatment plan review, a comprehensive treatment plan review can occur sooner than six months. And if that does occur, that would reset the clock for that six months. 
I hope that clarifies your question. Um, there's a question about should the treatment plan uh, be review, uh, the treatment plan review be coordinated by a care manager if there is one. Um, I think that's a nuanced question. I think it varies by the child and family. Uh, I would certainly encourage and hope so that that would be the case. Um, but certainly there are, um, a child being enrolled in care coordination for CFTSS is not a requirement. So there may be circumstances in which the child is not engaged in um, care management. And I think that's all we have. Oh, nope, bear with me. We're toggling between screens here. We appreciate your patience. Oh. Okay. Let me... Okay. Um, yep, we have another question. So for group notes, is it, is it required to write two notes, one for the overall group and then one for the individual participant, or would one note explaining how the individual responded in the group setting and individual goals interventions would suffice? So it would be the latter. You're absolutely right. It would be one, one um, progress note per child, not two. Thank you for that clarity. Um, there's a question about quality assurance. Does this mean we need a separate quality assurance policy? Um, if so, do you have a template? Uh, we don't. In all likelihood, if you're an agency with multiple um, programs, you likely do have a policy and procedure re related to quality assurance already in effect. I would welcome you to review that policy and procedure, obviously in a team um, among um, staff within your agency, to determine if it aligns with the standards of care and meets the requirements for CFTSS. It's quite possible that it does but I would strongly encourage you to review it and tie that back to the standards of care. Okay, another question is, can an integrated treatment plan include both an OLP providing services as well as residential services? I'm working in a CR, a community mm -hmm. residence, providing therapy under OLP, so my kids currently have two separate treatment plans, one for OLP, and one for community residence goals and objectives. So right now, um, yes, the treatment plan would be new, uh, unique to CFTSS. It would not be an integrated plan uh, with community residents. I'm assuming you're referencing that, that this is within the same agency, or at least I'm assuming that. Um, it is possible some EHR systems do um, afford staff to look within their system in an integrated fashion across various programs that the child may be enrolled in, certainly with appropriate consents, firewalls, all, all of the above. Um, so that is entirely possible. I, I would really um, strongly encourage you to um, go back to your agency and revisit your EHR system. If your EHR system does not have that capacity, yes. The hard and fast answer to that is yes. The CR would have a, a separate plan and so would CFTSS. Thank you for that question. Okay. If a, if a provider is a fully licensed LMHC or a licensed mental health counselor or an LCSW, a licensed clinical social worker, do they need a supervisor to sign off on their treatment plans? I think this is in reference to OLP, if you're the OLP service provider. Um, and the answer to that is no. Uh, this is more so around a licensed uh, master social worker um, that does not have their C, their clinical. Um, they would, if they're providing any clinical social work, uh, they would need the sign off of their um, supervisor, likely an LCSW. Um, should we use the DOH, Department of Health Medical Necessity form, or could we use our own template. Um, I think that's in reference to the recommendation form. Um, that is a sample recommendation form. You can certainly use it if you so choose, but it is not a requirement. You can certainly create your own template. Can you please provide more details on including discharge criteria on a treatment plan? Um, 
So I'm not sure um, exactly what that pertains to. Like, um, uh, just to reiterate, so when you're working with the family, I'll talk about it th more through a process lens. When you're sitting down and working with the family from assessment, whether you're, you know, whether you're doing your service assessment or, or a formal clinical assessment, and then um, consequently you're developing a treatment plan and you're going through that process, one of the questions as you're identifying the goals and objectives that you'd be working on is also identifying when that goal would be met and when will we know we're done. When will we know it's time for discharge? So that criteria, identifying and articulating that criteria in the treatment plan so that you as the service provider and that child and family are in agreement of when you will know that um, these goals and objectives have been met. Um, that's what we're referencing there. If you need more clarity on that, um, I, I certainly encourage you to reach out. Does the CFTS service provider have to sign the treatment plan? Yes, so like we said before, because these services can be provided distinct of one another, they're not contingent upon one another, the service provider does need to, as that service provider of service does need to sign that treatment plan. Um, you are signing off that um, you are in agreement with the content in alignment with that child and family. Yes, for your specific service. Thank you, thank you for that. We're getting clarity in the room. <laughs> okay. Okay, unless I'm not viewing these correctly, I think we've gotten through most, if not all, of them. Yeah, I, th I think we did, unless I'm doing something in error on my end, I think we've gotten through um, most, if not all, of the questions as it relates to the content that we discussed today. Um, if we didn't get to your question, or it could be user error on my end, I will admit, um, I, as Anne said, I would strongly encourage you to um, reach out to the contact information that was provided in the slides um, if your question was not answered today or if you have follow-up questions as a result of today's presentation. Okay, so I put up on the screen um, the mailbox um, that uh, would be most appropriate for you to submit documentation questions um, to the state related to today's webinar. We're also going to share uh, some of the questions, um, you know, needed some further clarification. If you need further clarification, uh, please email this. We'll also share any questions that came in through today's webinar um, with the state. Um, and that will really help uh, them and us develop additional uh, webinar resources. Um, and, and other resources other than webinars that would be appropriate um, to assist you with this work. Um, so uh, with that, I would like to thank our state partners uh, for this presentation today. And I'd also like to thank um, my colleague, Fung, who in the background has been managing all of these questions that are coming in. Um, and I hope you all have a, a pleasant day and a happy Halloween. Thank you very much. Thank you.